Um, okay, so I'm going to start, and someone will just interrupt me if we have any technical difficulties. Uh, for, the first thing I want to say is just I applaud you guys for doing this. Um, we've all had to learn so much in this new crazy world we're living in, and I cannot tell you how grateful I am to be with you guys tonight. As Diane said, I am a culinary instructor. I teach cooking classes. I speak to small groups on topics like cheese, chocolate, and champagne, and the French table. And I also take small groups to France for food and wine trips. In addition to that, I blog. And through this crazy last six months, really the only piece of work that I have continued to do is to blog, uh, to post on social media, uh, but I do feel, I feel a shift and I feel like things are going to be changing soon and hopefully I'll be back to it. I know I miss being with people and cooking with people. I did want to first, before I start, tell you how you can find me. If you're on Instagram, you can find me at simply a taste of Paris. If you're on Facebook, you can find me at a taste of Paris trips. And if you want me to find you, then you would want to email me at Lori, L-O-R-I-E, at a atasteofparis.net. And if you email me or message me on any of the social media sites, then I am going to send you some of my favorite cheese recipes, perfect for the fall entertaining season that we're about to enter. And I'm really hopeful that we do feel like entertaining this holiday season. I've got an artichoke cheese souffle. I've got calvados uh, pears over brie. And I've got an herbed goat cheese that I'm gonna share with you. So if you'll just email me and I'll try to remember to give you that email address again at the end. Um, but really without further ado, I would really like to get started and talk to you about cheese. Um, Diane mentioned that I'm really going to do most of my presentation from the perspective of French cheese. Um, I do absolutely adore what I get to do, which is take uh, groups to France. One of the things we do, we, we take cooking classes, we work with French chefs, we taste French wines. I also work in a visit to a French flea market on every trip. Um, and I'm always looking for these beautiful antique boards that make great um, receptacles for cheese boards. And so today, I'm not going to use these antique ones. I'm going to actually use this beautiful olive wood board that I picked up in Provence. And I don't know if you can tell by looking at it, but it's very, very heavy. You can tell this was a huge tree. I carried this back in the bottom of my suitcase and don't know how I got it through without being charged for my bag because it is very heavy, which actually makes it perfect for a cheese board because you don't have to worry about it sliding around when people are trying to cut. So before we get started building our board with some of the cheeses that I recommended to you guys, I wanna tell you a little bit about French, the French and their cheese. First of all, in France, cheese is very, very serious business. There are literally thousands of varieties of cheese. I've had some people tell me, ah, oh, there's 365 types of cheese, one for every day of the year. But the truth is, of the varieties, there's different aging and different aging processes. So really, there may only be 300 or so varieties of cheese, but within those varieties, there's lots of different variations, and we're going to talk about that as we get into it today. Um, the French are very serious about cheese, as I've mentioned, and in fact, there is a dedicated course to cheese, and you may already know this. So if you're having a traditional cheese, a, a, a traditional a French meal, say you're invited, you say you're lucky enough, to be invited to someone's home for a French meal, um, you would be served um, your appetizer. It would not be cheese. So you would not find a cheese board out with wine as you enter their home. That's not how they do cheese. Cheese is actually right after the main course as dessert or before dessert. So it is its own dedicated course. And cheese in France is never served with anything else. So it's not served with jam, honey, nuts, 
dried fruits, fruit. Like we love to make our beautiful big boards. Um, and I don't know about you, but I love to make a really beautiful, colorful board if I'm having guests over. Or sometimes just for my husband and I to enjoy a glass of wine on a Friday night, um, we call it our French picnic snack is what we do a lot of times and it, just cheese wouldn't be enough so we like to add fruits and all kinds of other things um, but in France when they have their cheese course it's very serious you're going to find only cheese on the board now you may find butter sometimes there'll be butter on the board as well and then the cheese is served with French bread never crackers um, the French don't really get crackers they don't really understand crackers in France it's always bread and rarely will you find the bread on the board. Usually it's in a basket that's passed. And that's really when you're going to find the bread. You know, a lot of times you sit down at a French restaurant and you wonder, where's the bread? And you certainly wonder, where's the butter? Because they don't necessarily serve butter with their bread uh, like we expect them to. Um, but you'll find it on the cheese course. That's when they're very serious about their bread and you'll find it there. Um, okay, so as we start to talk about cheese, I've got lots of varieties of cheese here that we're going to talk about and we're going to place on a board. And um, I do want to call your attention to the fact that in France, the, the reason why they serve cheese at the end of the meal is it's considered to be a digestive. Um, in France, most of the cheese is made with unpasteurized milk. So that means raw milk. And the reason why it's a digestive is there are enzymes in that fermentation process of creating the cheese. Um, just like we eat yogurt to give us a healthy gut bacteria, it's the same thing. Raw milk cheese has live cultures and that's what is considered uh, the digestive quality of cheese. So that's how come it comes after the main course. Uh, for me personally, I've never closed a meal with cheese, um, unless I'm in France. I close my meals with chocolate. It's just how I roll. I love chocolate and I don't really feel satisfied until I've had that bite of chocolate after a meal. But nonetheless, today we're talking about the French. And so many of the French cheeses are going to be unpasteurized. Now, I know I sent you with a list uh, to Trader Joe's and some of these cheeses I call for are French cheeses and others are not. Uh, typically in this country, even a French cheese is going to be made with pasteurized milk. However, I have three cheeses on my board today that are made with unpasteurized milk. Now, what do I want to tell you about that? I want to tell you that when you open a cheese that is unpasteurized, especially a soft cheese like this um, St. Andre um, Brie that I'm holding, you want to smell it. If you smell an ammonia smell, then you know that there could be a problem with the cheese. Um, so what you want to do when you unwrap the cheese, you always want to take a smell. Um, and if you smell ammonia, you want to leave the cheese out on the counter for, oh, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. If you sniff it and you still smell ammonia, the cheese may be bad. One of the things about unpasteurized cheese in this country and French cheeses in this country, especially this time of year, is we don't know how long those cheeses sat, say, on the tarmac waiting to come into the country, clearing customs and that kind of thing. So to be the safest, you would want to select your unpasteurized cheeses, um, in my recommendation, would be in the very cold months, the winter months of the year. Now, when I buy cheese at Trader Joe's, if it's just for us, I never really worry about it. I think they do a fantastic job of keeping everything really fresh. But if you do smell that ammonia smell, that's a clue to you that you would want to um, pass on that cheese, maybe take it back. Um, just incidentally, I, I do not work for Trader Joe's. They do not send me samples. I just happen to be um, a fan. It's my closest grocery store, and I find the products that they have uh, to be a fantastic value and I'm always thinking about value, especially being a culinary instructor, you know, I have to think about pricing. 
Um, so, but Whole Foods uh, in Plano has, no, I'm sorry, Central Market in Plano has a fantastic selection of traditional French cheeses. And I highly recommend that you go there and select some cheeses and try some different kinds of cheeses. But in the winter months, just to be safe and, and sound that those cheeses are good to go. Okay, so I thought what might be fun would be to build a board as the French would build. And so how we're going to do that, and I use this strategy um, when I'm building any kind of cheese board, even if I'm doing more of an American style where I'm gonna load it with lots of jams and sauces and crackers and fruits and things. You always start left to right, like you would read a book, light, so soft cheeses to hard cheeses to strong cheeses. So soft to hard to strong. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's talk about this. And I'm just gonna use my hands here. Um, so I'm gonna start with the softest cheese I have, which is a chef. So a fresh chef, what does chef mean? It means goat in French. So fresh chef is cheese that has not been aged. So it's very, very, very soft. It's spreadable. Um, incidentally, cheese is intended to be served at room temperature. So it's great to build your board 30 minutes before you're gonna serve it, or at least pull it out of the fridge and let it sit 30 minutes or an hour before you serve the cheese. So we'll start with our, our soft cheese, our fresh cheeses. So again, goat cheese that has not been aged. Our next category of cheese would be soft cheeses, and this would include ripened cheeses. So I know that I recommended the cheese for you guys to try the Port Salut. I went to Traders twice to find that cheese once it got closer and could not find it. Um, so I just went with a Saint Andre. I think this is a little more interesting than just a traditional brie. This is a seasonal cheese, so you'll only find it certain times of the year. Um, it's a beautiful cheese. You can see just how uh, creamy the texture is. Again, very much like a brie, but the brand name indicates a certain method for ripening the cheese. So while we're building our board, I'm gonna go ahead and talk to you a little bit about brie. So one of the things that you may have noticed when you go to buy brie, and brie tends to be one of the easiest things. We can just grab a, a wedge of brie, set it out with some crackers, and people are usually pretty happy. They understand what a brie is. Um, these days in the market, you'll find a light brie, so a brie that is light. Um, you'll find double cream brie, and you'll find triple cream brie. And all that means is a light brie is made with lower fat milk. It's gonna have very little flavor. I, I think if you're gonna do a brie, skip that one. Um, and then a double cream brie just means double the cream was added in the cheese making process and triple the cream, triple the cream in the cheese making process. So it just means it's fattier, it's richer. Okay, now a ripened cheese is gonna have a, a, a rind. It's gonna have a white powdery um, texture on the outside and that's how you know it's ripened. This can be ripened anywhere from two weeks to about three months. The longer it's ripened, the firmer the cheese is. I'm seeing a message pop up so I'm just gonna walk closer. No, I think I'm all right. Just wanted to make sure it wasn't a message from you guys. Okay, so I've got my goat cheese, my softest. I've got my ripened cheese, which is also very soft. From here, I'm going to go to my Conte. So I recommended, this is one of the cheeses that I recommended. Always smell the cheese. This, this, lets, you, this lets your palate start to get ready for what it is you're gonna taste. And I apologize when I talk about food, my mouth waters, I picked up that nasty habit from the French. If you know anybody French and you start talking to them about food, their mouth starts to water. It's the most embarrassing thing, so I'm sorry. I'm glad you guys aren't here because you'd be laughing at me and you're probably laughing at me at your home. Uh, but anyway, this is a beautiful, beautiful cheese. This is, also, this is a raw milk cheese as well. So our St. Andre is a raw milk cheese. Our Conte is a raw milk cheese. Um, okay, and then the last cheese I recommended for you was is not a French cheese. But this happens to be 
one of my favorite cheeses and as many workshops and classes as I've hosted where we have cheese, I always offer this variety and it is always, always a favorite. Um, it is just so delicious. This is a hard cheese. So the Conte is a hard cheese. I don't have a semi-soft cheese. So it, it goes, let me just back up. It goes fresh cheese, soft cheese, which is our brie, semi-soft, that would be Gouda or Fontina or mozzarella, something like that. A jack cheese is a semi-soft, a, a semi-hard cheese, semi-soft, either way you want to say it. And then we move into our hard cheeses. So our Conte is a hard cheese, our Toscano is a hard cheese. And then last but not least, also a raw milk cheese is going to be a blue cheese. Now my blue cheese is actually softer than these two cheeses, but I put it at the end of my board because it is a, a, a very strong cheese. So that's how I like to do it. Um, soft to hard and then strong, strongest on the very end. So this would be a traditional uh, French cheese board ready to go and ready to be served. Now I have to be honest with you. Um, cheese is very expensive. It's, it's expensive here. It's very expensive in France. So you would not be served this many varieties of cheese if you were say invited to a family dinner. You might have two, maybe three varieties of cheese. What they do is they buy their cheese, they eat that cheese, they wrap it up each night, they pull it out. As it starts to get skinny, they add another variety and they just keep going like that. That would be the traditional way. So they wrap it up in paper, not in plastic because we don't wanna kill those, those live bacteria that are creating the, the goodness for our gut and the closing of the digestive system. So never do we wrap our cheese in plastic. When you bring your cheese home from the market, um, you will want to wrap it in parchment paper or there's some special little bags for cheese that you can label. Um, but that is how we store our cheese. So I wish I could pause at this moment and take questions, uh, but I think what I'll do is I'll just move right on to the next little bit that we're going to talk about. And uh, so we'll talk about cutting the cheese. Uh, that always gets a laugh. So we're going to cut the cheese um, and then we're going to talk about tasting the cheese. Um, okay. So one of the things my guest, uh, so one, one of the styles of classes that I teach and hopefully I'll be back to it soon are two day French workshops and we cook breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, we sit for uh, the courses um, we set, we sit for the courses and we always have a cheese course, uh, with our meals. I always sit with the guests, um, and it's a different style of class. When I teach a two hour class, I'm very busy cooking and finishing everything and, uh, serving. But when we do the workshops, I sit with you. And this is one of the things that I enjoy the very most is really teaching people, um, cheese etiquette, if you will. Um, so when you go to a party and you are presented with a cheese board, you're probably not going to see one like this. I mean, you're probably going to see it with all the beautiful other things on the board. Uh, but when you approach the cheese, you'll find a knife. And I would have several knives on a cheese board this size. But let's just say you think, ah, this one looks really good. And you go up to the cheese and you cut it like this. Can you see? You cut the end off, take that to your plate, and enjoy that cheese. Did you know that that is rude? <laughs> that is rude. <laughs> so in order to really understand this philosophy, um, you're going to need to understand a little bit about how cheese is aged. And this is one of my favorite things that we do in France. We often go and visit cheesemongers that actually age their own cheeses. And so you get to see cheeses and taste cheeses in various stages of aging. Um, so che traditional cheese, and we're not talking about Wisconsin cheddar, which I know very little about, uh, we're talking about traditional French cheeses. They're, they're wheels of cheese, huge, huge wheels of cheese that are aged. And when you think about 
cheese in a wheel like this, sitting on the shelf of a, a fromagerie, aging for three months, six months, nine months, 36 months, you think about what happens to that cheese. So as part of the aging process, the milk is evaporating, the moisture is evaporating out of that cheese. And the cheese is becoming firmer and firmer and really smaller and smaller. And so if you think about this is a wedge of the cheese and you think about this being the outside of the wheel, this would be the driest part of the cheese and the most luscious part of the cheese would be the center. So if you cut the end off of all of these beautiful cheeses and take it to your plate, then you've taken the best part of the cheese or the heart of the cheese to your plate. Um, so you know what, here's the thing. If you've done that and, and, and even if you still do it, most people don't know this. I always make this joke. It doesn't matter how many times I explain this to my husband. He locks the center off and takes it right to his plate. Um, and you know, and that's okay. There's absolutely no judgment here for me, but I'm just trying to teach you um, something about cheese etiquette. So what you would do instead um, is you would take your knife and you would cut your cheese like so. Okay, so you would take a little bit from the heart and you would take a little bit more as it goes back. Now, this is a huge piece of cheese, and I don't know about you, I like just a bite. So then what you could do is you could cut the cheese in half or even into three pieces, leave those two behind and take this one to your plate. So that would be how you would manage a wedge like this. Now, the Conte, which is my favorite cheese, my favorite French cheese, if I hadn't already mentioned that, I love Conte cheese. It's a very common cheese. In France, you'll find this at every food market. You'll find it at every fromagerie. Um, and you will find it at various stages of aging. This packaging did not tell me how long it was aged. I'm guessing three, four months, not very long because it's pretty soft. Um, but it's typically served like this. The rind is hard. You would not eat the rind, I would not eat the rind on this cheese. It is completely edible. All rind of all cheese is completely edible, but um, unless your gut is really used to it, you may have a little trouble with the harder rind cheeses. So how you would cut this cheese is you would cut it like so. You would start to cut the end and you would take this piece to your plate and remove the rind at your plate and enjoy this piece of cheese. Part of the heart, part of the end. It's all delicious. Uh, the more this cheese is aged, the harder it gets, the more concentrated it gets. And the more little sugar crystals from the milk that you get on your palate when you're, when you're eating that. Now, I wanna talk about slicing brie because St. Andre, Port Salute, they're varieties of brie. Um, it, not really brie, they're ripened cheeses. Um, so, but I want to uh, explain to you what you would do on a brie. So I understand that not everybody likes the white powdery surface, that some people don't like that. But for the brie, it is considered a delicacy. So when you slice the brie, you would take a slice and always take the rind to your plate. And then if you don't wanna eat the rind, you don't have to eat the rind. Again, there's no judgment. That's one thing I love about the French is they don't judge you. If you don't like it, you don't like it. Seems like here we judge each other for things that we don't like. Uh, but anyway, uh, you take the rind to your plate, eat the creamy center, leave the rind behind if it's too strong for you. Um, but I do encourage you to try tasting it um, I think it's wonderful and adds, it's really the character of the cheese is the rind. One of the things I didn't consider is just how sticky my hands were gonna get with the cheese. Okay, so that's cutting the cheese. And so from this section, we'll go right into tasting the cheese. Now I hope you guys didn't feel pressured to buy all of the varieties of cheese. And I certainly hope you didn't feel like you needed to buy all the wine. The idea was, that because we're talking about cheese, it would be nice 
to have a little taste of cheese as we're talking about it. And so my talk is almost over, but I do want to talk about tasting cheese because there is a process involved. Now, you know, most of us just simply have cheese, we enjoy cheese, and that's great. But if you're ever invited to a more serious cheese tasting or you go to a shop that is more specialized in cheese, or let's say you happen to meet a cheesemonger and they want to share their cheese with you. It would be nice to really understand a great way to get all of the flavor out of the cheese. So much like tasting wine, uh, there's a process or a way that we taste cheese. So I want to teach that to you. So what we would do is, in, um, so I'm going to do it. I'm gonna explain it, I'm gonna do it, and I'm gonna invite you guys to do it right along with me. So what we'll do is we'll take a bite of cheese and I'm gonna take the brie and I'm gonna put it in my mouth. And in order to really, well, first, first thing I'm gonna do is smell the cheese. We always smell the cheese because it gets us ready to start to notice the different flavors. And then we're gonna smell the rind. Notice that the rind has a little bit stronger smell, even on, like the Conte. The cheese smells buttery and the rind smells almost more woodsy. You know, some people would say, ah, oh, it smells like dirt. Well, how we say that is we say it's woodsy. So it's a little herbaceous and a little woodsy to me. Okay, so what we do is we take a bite of the cheese, we put it in our mouth, and using our tongue, we paint it all over the roof of our mouth. And then we breathe in through our nose and let the air go back to the back of our throat and notice the flavors that you pick up, the aromas. Okay, so I'm gonna do it and you don't, you guys don't watch me, you guys do it there. Because it's kind of awkward. So I paint it all over the roof of my mouth. Oh, it's wonderful. It's so salty. And then I'm gonna breathe in and I like to close my eyes because I can sense different flavors when I do that. Very, very, very good. This is a delicious cheese. I know that this is not one that I recommended. The Port Salute is gonna have a little more gaminess, a little more flavor than even the St. Andre. The St. Andre is just really nice and salty and buttery. Okay, so that's that one. Now, I also recommended some wine. So I wanna talk just for a second about cheese and wine. So cheese and wine make a very happy marriage. So really, any wine that you love and any cheese that you love work together famously. If you really wanna do pairings, what I like to say is, especially if you're doing French cheeses is French champagne goes well with every cheese. And I happen to love champagne. I love bubbles. I do a whole talk on bubbles. Um, so, so French champagne or any sparkling, like any brute, you know, nothing sweet, but anything very dry, sparkling, whether it be Prosecco, Cava, a French sparkling or a, a champagne go wonderfully with cheese. So I just wanted to mention that. I'm not a white wine drinker, so I don't have the Sancerre, but the typical rule of thumb is that your lighter wines, the white wines, go better with the lighter cheeses. So if you want to have your friends over and do a wine and cheese pairing, you would take your white wine, your Chardonnay or your Sancerre or whatever you love, um, your Pinot Grigio, and you would serve that with your fresh goat cheese and or and or your your brie. So you would stick in here. Now I will tell you because of the buttery quality of the brie, it will absolutely stand up to a red wine. But if you're doing pairings, you could do it that way. The white wines here, and then as you work towards your semi soft, which again I don't really have any here today. That would be Fontina Gouda. Um, jack cheeses, um, and this Conte is pretty soft, so we could probably consider this one, since it's not aged very long, to be a semi-soft, are gonna go great with your rosé wines. Now, I typically, I, I uh, am a new rosé wine drinker. I've only been drinking rosé wine for about five years, and um, I, I only like the French ones. Um, 
they're just really dry, really crisp. And because I'm a huge red wine drinker, they remind me, the French rosés remind me of red wines. So I think that's why I like them. The other good news about rosés is they're very reasonably priced. So you know, this wine is brought to market when it's ready to drink. So you would never want to say buy a case of this and keep it on hand for a year or two. Um, when the rosé wine starts to change from the brilliant grapefruit color that this one is to a duller shade, you're, you're, you're past time on the wine. So it's, as the color starts to change, um, you really know that wine is not going to be as good. So buy your rosés when you're ready to drink them. And I mean, for $8, I think this is a really sweet one. I hope, I don't mean sweet in flavor. I just mean sweet as in a great wine. And it's still so warm outside. So wonderful to enjoy those. And then um, I, I also recommended the, the, um, the Bordeaux, which is the Tetra de Moulin. Um, so this one is just a nice full-bodied, wine, red wine, you know it's full bodied when the tape, when the bottle looks like this, as opposed to being sloped, you know that's gonna be a, a medium to full bodied wine. This will stand up to your hard cheeses and will stand up to your blue cheese as well. So let's talk about how we would taste uh, wine and cheese together. So we all know that we first, you know, sniff our wine. You always wanna take a sip of wine before you give it air. So, because you wanna compare the difference between the aerated wine and the straight wine right out of the bottle. So, we'll take a sip, we'll give it a little air. Same thing we did when we breathe through our nose, we were giving the cheese air in our, uh, in our mouth in order to taste the different flavors. So we give it a little air, we smell it again, we taste it, oh, so much better. Smells and tastes so much better after it has a little air behind it. So we're going to do the same thing. This time I'm, I'm going to try the Toscano. I know I love this cheese. So I'm going to take this. I'm going to do just as I did before where I chew the cheese. I paint it on the roof of my mouth. I take a sip of the wine and then it's kind of a trip to pull the air in through the, the mouth. Um, I really recommend if you haven't done that a lot, that just go ahead and take the air in through the nose instead of trying to pull it through the mouth because what can happen is the high alcohol volume or the high alcohol content of the wine can hit you in the back of the throat and make you cough. So we're just gonna taste them together. So the cheese. So it's all over the inside of my mouth. Now I'll take some wine. Mm. It's amazing how that cheese really opens up with the wine. As I said, cheese and wine together are like a marriage made in heaven. So um, I, I invite you to explore with all all of your cheese and your wines and find the combination that you really love and you really enjoy. And, you know, especially in times like this, you know, I, I don't think when we're struggling and not getting to see people and not getting to go and do the things that we love to do, that that's a good time to deny ourselves the enjoyment and the pleasure in life. In fact, I really don't think denying ourselves the pleasure in life is ever really a good idea, but I invite you to really take some time and taste your food, especially your cheese and your wines, and I hope that you will enjoy that. Um, once again, I, I just want to tell you how grateful I am to have been with you this evening. I hope you enjoyed um, talking about cheese as much as I did. Um, I hope that you guys will find me. Again, I blog and I can be found at, at tasteofparis.net. But the best way is for me to, to find you by you sending me an email at Lori, L-O-R-I-E, at a tasteofparis.net. And I'll send you those recipes and add you to my blog list. Um, you can also find me out there. But I'm .net, not .com. .com is somebody else. So thanks so much for having me.